Get a Book. Today presents Strike Battleship Engineers, Book Two in the Starships at War series, by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2017. Attention, all hands. Attention, all hands. Stand by for a message from Charlie Oscar. She is a weapon of war. Seventy-two stories tall from her ventral armor plating to the top of the Skywatch Tower. Her hull volume is sufficient to contain 32 Ford-class wet Navy aircraft carriers. She displaces 5.07 million tons at 1.0 Terran gravity. Her main power systems generate enough energy in 12 minutes to power a city of 5 million people for a month. She carries 90 strike fighter spacecraft, two dozen gunships, and 70 surface assault mechs. She can launch strike operations against targets 3 billion miles away. Her main battery's destructive power is measured in megatons per second. Her mission, to protect mankind. And her motto is both promise and warning. Strength cometh from heaven. Get officially licensed gear worthy of a battleship crew. Links are below. Carry on. Chapter 59. XO on the bridge. Honora Doverly moved swiftly to the center chair aboard Argent. She didn't recognize anyone else on the deck other than her signals officer. Force commander, sound off. The doctor fastened her shock harness and brought up her side con. Singleton, ma'am. All right, Mr. Singleton. I'd love to give you the 30,000-foot view, but we're up against it. Give me flight status on the Bucks and Sharks and an update on T-Hawk Green and make it fast. Aye, ma'am. Major Greg Singleton turned back to the Skywatch Space Lane Traffic Control Console. Scarcely four days ago, he was running the atmospheric air traffic tower on a Marine Reserve base on Core 4. He had all the training, but even he had to admit suddenly being put in charge of flight control for 23 fighters and 11 gunships was a bit overwhelming. All this aside from the fact he was a Marine officer serving on the bridge of a fleet capital ship. Tactical. I want a second-by-second -second track on our next pass over the strike point. If someone down there gives us a dirty look, I want you to howl like a pack of red bone hounds, clear? Aye, ma'am. Helm, take us to flight launch velocity. Signals? Zoni looked up from her station. Ma'am? Doverly smiled. What the hell are you doing on the bridge? Praying for war, Commander. Find someone to relieve you and take point for Tiger Shark 6 0. You'll be the strike leader for the Jack Wing. Good hunting. Zoni hesitated a moment, weighing the prospect of leaving her executive officer alone on the bridge. Then she realized how many replacement pilots were loose on the flight decks. She had to agree having at least one native Argent pilot in the attack wing might be a more worthy idea. Affirmative. Jets in five. Lieutenant Tixia vanished into the corridor towards the magneto lifts. A young man grabbed the headphones and hastily took the signal station. Open a channel to the minstrel. He fumbled through the procedure, once incorrectly, then again. Aye, ma'am, you're on. Normally Jace would have you float, Captain. What are your thoughts? How about we join the strike wing? I'd offer you an escort, but I wouldn't want to make Argent's gunnery section look bad, came the snappy reply from Lieutenant Islington. Honora grinned. Skywatch skippers had a long tradition of ribbing one another. Very well, Minstrel. Coordinate with Strike Leader Designator Jackrabbit 994. Give him hell. That is affirmative, Argent. See you on the beach. DSS Minstrel pinged Argent's transponder channel with the customary farewell code and banked out of formation towards the Strike Wing's rally point. Honora was well aware of how much firepower and combat experience Rebecca's crew could bring to the fight. She also knew enemy captains were rarely prepared to face a 28,000-ton starship pretending to be a fighter. Ma'am, I have a priority signal from Nemesis 8, requesting emergency executive conference on battle frequency Juliet 9. Honora configured her sidecon. Go ahead, Nemesis. Skywatch confirming primary tracking on inbounds. Numbering up to heavies. Signal main body. Recommend alert one. Condition status override. Enemy vessels now inside our defensive perimeter and closing. Acknowledged, Nemesis. Stand by to establish data link telemetry and upgrade alert status. Doverly switched channels on her side con. Pilot, bring the Argent about. New course 116 Mark 10. The Marine pilot at the helm acknowledged and began gently banking the enormous battleship to starboard. This time, she pulled out of orbit with flawless precision and pivoted gracefully towards the oncoming enemy attack force. Honora keyed her side con again. Signals, upgrade alert status all decks. 
Scramble flight. All designators. All hands battle stations. Force commander, stand by to launch strike wing on my signal. The clear channel alarm sounded on every fleet transmission frequency. Skywatch officers, marines, and pilots all heard the pleasant female voice issue the simultaneous alert. Attention all stations. Attention all stations. This is Argent Force Command on Emergency Channel Juliet 9. Flag signals battle stations. Deck officers report alert status to the first officer. Engage emergency conference on this frequency and stand by for strike operations. Meanwhile, on Flight 3, the pilots of Skywatch Marine Squadron 44, known as the Fighting Frogs, had acclimated themselves as well as they could to their new 2G Yellow Jacket fighters and the shark themed warpaint. Squadron leader Lieutenant Colonel Brock Bubba Taylor took his engines to launch power and aggressively saluted the ensign. Moments later, the deck signals shifted green. He slammed his feet down on the release locks and held the controls as Tiger Shark 1 bolted into space. Over the course of the next 71 seconds, the rest of Argent Squadron 60 followed. Once the entire wing was in space, they formed up and raced towards the rally point. On Flight 2, the scene was even more ominous, as the rarely deployed heavy gunships of Tarantula Hawk Green hovered across the spacious double-sized flight deck to their launch tunnels, ground lamps rotating. The grinning faces of leprechauns with knives in their teeth, reptilian heads with frowning eyes, shamrocks, emerald jewels, and at least one tree with a sneering face carved into its trunk were emblazoned on the hulls of the formidable warships. Their crews weren't as experienced as Commander Doverly would have preferred, but fortunately for Captain Hunter's hastily replaced forces, the Marines had a few vessels that were at least somewhat similar to the T-Hawk and served a roughly similar role in surface warfare. So it wasn't that much of a stretch to divide up the crews and get the wing operational. Unlike T-Hawk Black, T-Hawk Green was optimized for space warfare. The heavier space frames and additional missile racks made the A variant on the Tarantula Hawk design much more effective in open space engagements, especially against scout, frigate, and destroyer targets. Eleven of them in a tight formation could muster the firepower of a full-sized heavy cruiser while maintaining the ability to outright avoid the most common weapons aboard their opposition. The gunships were one of the factors that made Argent both versatile and dangerous. Shamrock 10's sharp wing structures folded over its hull as it ducked into the double-wide rail tunnel. The deck stacker locked the power capacitors with the pull of a huge handle on the overhead observation bay. The blast door sealed the tunnel a moment before the lights dimmed and the entire flight deck lurched. The warship blasted into space at hundreds of miles per hour and continued accelerating. Shamrock 10 deployed its weapon systems again and banked around to the port side of the gargantuan battleship just in time to slide into formation with the entirety of Argent Squadron 994. Commander Doverly stood observing the real-time display of her squadron's flying combat patterns around her ship as they gathered their remaining fighters and gunships. Force Commander, I want Wildcat Squadron 16, 3, and 85 in space six minutes after the last jack is dealt. Clear? Affirmative, ma'am. Coding your orders. Honora took a moment. She wished Jason had been aboard to see it, because her orders had just made history, at least for her current command. It was the first time Argent had ever launched a full Alpha Strike wing. What made it all the more remarkable was they were doing it with replacement crews consisting entirely of Marine combat pilots and deck crews. Honora had long ago learned to never underestimate a Skywatch Marine, but what she was observing now was the stuff of legend. Two squadrons of Jacks and a T-Hawk wing were minutes away from their rally point and a full-spectrum strike on the inbound task force. Three squadrons of Cats and a second T-Hawk wing were about to hit the east perimeter of the Lethe Deep Space with Argent's Havoc batteries providing gunnery support for Komanov's mobile base and a company of 18 Marine Paladin mechs from 7th Air Ground. She had to admit the full power of a Citadel-class battleship was more than she had imagined when she was recruited for her post. She also knew they needed everything they could muster to counter whatever might be lurking under that base. Commander Doverly hoped her captain had enough to prevail, because if she didn't, their worst nightmares about the threat to core space might become a reality, and soon. Chapter 60 Captain Dara Walsh silently regarded the main viewer on the bridge of DSS Rhode Island. Two watches had been dismissed by now, and his XO was becoming more and more concerned. She stood near him, pretending to be looking at the same thing he was. Sir, with all due respect, you need rest. 
If we go into hard action, the fatigue... Give me that DRAD reading again, signals, Walsh interrupted. A pause. Zero, zero, 006, no detectable delta from baseline since the last sink, sir. Nessa saw her captain curse under his breath. What is it? He's modulating his engine emissions. I thought we were going to catch him at the edge of the atmosphere and at least get a course track, Walsh growled. But every bloody time he shifts his emissions and disappears before our Navicomp can get a waveform. Keep driving him, Helm. Get us in closer. Lieutenant Boyle moved to the tactical station and had the duty officer pull up the orbital track. How accurate is our position map? There's 5,000 miles of play along every vector, Walsh replied without moving. I could flush him out of there, but it will take all our birds. What are our chances with energy only? Too risky. Energy targeting is a toss-up as long as his cloak is operational. The mantids, on the other hand. D-Rad spike, 014, right on schedule. You keep playing me, you bastard, Walsh muttered. One way or another, you're going to make a mistake, and I'm going to be there when you do. Helm, steer four degrees starboard. Maintain your velocity. Aye, Captain. Helm answering. Course now 4-1 Mark 1. Clock cycling 2-0-0. Back to our original track. The malevolent shape of Walsh's destroyer banked quietly and then resumed her course along the extreme outer edge of Bayon 7's magnetic field. The dark side of the planet's atmosphere was peaceful, which only made things more difficult for the Rhode Island. As long as the chemical composition of the atmosphere was predictable, a cloaked ship could remain practically invisible indefinitely. The alternative was the stock market of tactical officers. They needed conditions to change in much the same way stockbrokers needed prices to change. Up or down didn't matter. All that mattered was what they could buy or sell while conditions were in flux. It was when the readings changed that the slight difference between the new and old would reveal clues as to the position of a cloaked ship. If Rhode Island caught a solid waveform, her enemy would be reduced to background radiation and a debris field so fast they wouldn't have time to realize they were dead. Steady as she goes, Helm. Walsh stood resolute. Aside from his words, it was hard to tell if he was even breathing. Boyle cycled and recycled the tactical map, applying every overlay she could think of. Nothing brought up more than the edge of the planet and the same spectrographic analysis pattern for the atmosphere. Now she was cursing under her breath. Tactical. Identify readings at planet's edge. Analysis quickly, Walsh ordered. Boyle relinquished the controls, and the tactical officer focused the ship's short-range sensors on the darker patch at the edge of the planet's terminator. Low pressure zone in the atmosphere, sir. Could be a high altitude storm of some kind. Latitude? 41 degrees north approx. Helm, hard a larboard. All ahead emergency flank speed. The Rhode Island's pilot narrowly avoided an embarrassing accident at the sudden shout from her captain. She shoved the controls and rammed the throttle forward. The destroyer dove back to port and exploded towards the planet's surface. Missile warning. Threat board. Vampire. Vampire. Countermeasures. Now. Walsh grabbed an overhead handhold to steady himself as the deck pitched under his feet. Lieutenant Boyle was thrown against a bank of sensor readouts. She grabbed the shock harness on the second sensor officer's crash couch to keep from slamming to the deck. High-speed breakaway transmitters rocketed into space as Rhode Island rolled away. A deadly antimatter torpedo screamed through the deflection zone only a few hundred yards from where Walsh's ship had been a moment before. The warhead impacted one of the countermeasures and detonated at a range of 65 miles. The shock knocked out every light on the bridge. For several chilling moments, the only illumination was the glowing red threat indicators. The captain's voice shouted in the darkness, Tactical, bring us up fast. When she could see again, Boyle noticed Walsh was still forward of the pilot station, watching the display like a hungry vulture. Forward launchers 2 and 3, target the trailing edge of the storm at 06. Affirmative, warhead ready indicators missiles 2, 3. Fire blind, push him, tactical, push him. The lethal warship banked back to starboard and accelerated towards her fading target. A pair of agile mantid class birds screamed from Rhode Island's forward launchers and tore through the orbital track like demons with rocket engines. A moment later, concussion warheads detonated, causing devastating spherical explosions, each of which tore a million tons of gas and debris out of Bayonne 7's exosphere and then vaporized it in a 12 million degree hypernova. Waves of feedback plasma energy shook the angry Skywatch ship like an avalanche. Weapons detonation, range 0 
Readings, quickly. DRAD indicator 015, no change. Boyle was back at tactical, watching, reading, looking for anything that she could use to suss out even a hint of the enemy ship's course. But it was like looking at a calm ocean from the beach. There just wasn't anything there for the Rhode Island's sensitive tracking instruments to get hold of. She moved quickly back to her captain's side. We didn't even get a firing position. He's got a scorch mark in the seat of his pants now, Lieutenant, Walsh said with a sinister tone in his voice. He takes another shot at us, and I'm going to give him a set of bite marks to go with it. Helm, resume orbital track. Back to our original course. Ahead one half. Reload forward launchers two and three and arm warheads for short-range engagement. Rhode Island maneuvered back to her pursuit course and went back to watching and waiting with a full spread of concussion missiles armed. A chill crawled up Lieutenant Boyle's neck. No matter how high the rank of the person asking, she knew she would never be able to explain how the captain knew. The ship's automatic threat avoidance systems never activated. Not one instrument on the ship had registered a thing until the enemy missile was right on top of them. Captain Walsh folded his hands behind his back, then took a deep breath and exhaled, eyes fixed on the forward viewer. Chapter 61 the airtight blast door at the east end of Gunfighter's Quarry looked as if someone had attempted to construct their best interpretation of a nest of snakes around its hard lock. Smoke grenades had already rendered the area unviewable by standard video, and the Marines knew their tack suits would prevent infrared from pinpointing their positions. The combat engineers had plenty of time to do their work, and they responded with a masterpiece of demolition tactics. Since they had the time, Captain Hunter had waited as patiently as possible for the two explosives specialists on his team to bypass the system's security devices, but his suspicions regarding the sophistication of his enemy were confirmed when nearly an hour had passed and they were no closer to gaining entry. They would have to force their way in, and by the looks on the faceplate-clad faces of the Marines around the entry point, it didn't take much to guess what they expected on the other side. Thick white noodle-like lengths of an ultra-high temperature demolition compound were painted onto the dense gray composite metal. At the edges, the compound had left blackened scoring where chemical reactions had already begun to eat away at the door. Several shock riflemen retreated to a minimum range of 100 yards, all took cover behind the largest rocks, weapons at the ready. The sharpshooter Marine looked over at Captain Hunter. Jason nodded. The Marine took careful aim with his TK-40 and fired. A white flash and atmosphere-shattering explosion thumped across the quarry. The closest rocks nearly disintegrated, and a cloud of acrid smoke drifted in all directions. Now! The two engineers that had failed to overcome the security systems did have one accomplishment to their credit, and that was to build a drop door above the subterranean tunnel leading to the lowest levels of the Lethe Deep's planetary defense base. The mechanism was, by some standards, crude and low-tech, but nobody could argue with its effectiveness. Essentially, it consisted of a wide but relatively light composite surface suspended above the entry point. The combat engineers of the 117th swore by their doors because once activated, they would fall to the ground or deck in front of the assault point and bring a medium-strength battle screen up across the surface. Any explosive, heavy weapon, grenade, rocket, or other attempt to hit the first Marines through the door would therefore be deflected right back against the defenders. Drop doors usually didn't last long, but while they were in place, they often did a magnificent job of softening up the heaviest resistance. The barrier thudded against the hard-packed ground seconds after the explosion impact wore off. A fiery burst of red-hot flame escaped around the edges of the drop door a moment later, followed by another thundering blast. Screams of pain echoed from inside the tunnel as the drop door pitched forward and clanged against the ground. The same Marine sharpshooter who had detonated the anti-mechanism charge was well prepared. He had been holding his aim into the tunnel since his first shot. A shape moved in the smoke and he opened fire. White bolts of plasma energy flashed into the cramped space, burning the walls and floor, pulverizing blast points in the metal-reinforced rock and hitting two humanoid defenders' center mass with at least two shots each. As the humanoid shapes fell back, a Sarn commando sprinted out of the tunnel. The closest two marines wheeled back as the enormous lizard-like creature took a mighty swing at one of them with a cutting weapon that looked to be the size of a small car fender. The marine sharpshooter fired at least nine rounds, but the melee prevented all but one from connecting. 
The lone sizzling wound in the creature's shoulder only seemed to enrage it further. It reached up with both arms and slammed its weapon down, breaking one Marine's TK-40 in half. It was winding up for a second attack when a powerful bolt from Captain Hunter's sidearm struck it in the neck. It staggered back a few steps before the tenth shot from the sharpshooter hit it in the side of the head. The creature's weapon banged against the tunnel floor. Look sharp, Hunter said as he searched the downed commando for anything useful. He found three incendiary grenades which he fastened to the combat harness around his tack suit. Aye, replied Strike Sergeant Lance O'Carroll as he performed a quick ready check on his weapon. The TK-40 still had a full charge. He cycled its capacitors and set the safety systems on standby. Configuring the weapon this way would require him to aim the weapon in order to fire it. One thing TK-40S could do that previous generations of Marine rifles could not was detect a non-Skywatch target through its optic system. Skywatch landing parties and Marine combat units were all equipped with short-range transponders in addition to their battle-hardened comlinks. The newest generation of weapons used the unique signatures from these devices to separate friendly from hostile personnel on the battlefield. The results were so encouraging that similar systems were currently in development to add the capability to vehicle and spacecraft-mounted weapons. Mac, keep that handheld going and key for Sarn life signs. Aye, Captain, Corporal Martin replied. No ranks, Mac, O'Carroll said sharply. If anyone hears you, it makes him the primary target. Aye, she replied, her eyes a little wider than normal. Two by two, and check the corners, Hunter said as he led the way into the complex. The floor was dusty. It was relatively easy to see where the small group of defenders had rushed through the dark tunnel towards the access port. An immense scorch mark covered the walls and ceiling around the spot where the second explosion had detonated. Pieces of scattered wreckage were still burning among the five burned bodies strewn along the corridor. Looks like we caught them with their own rocket, sir, O'Carroll said. I was on the fence about drop doors until today. Now I'm a believer, Hunter replied. Keep one of those handhelds keyed to sweep beams. If there's anything in here that even looks like an infrared emitter, I want to know about it before we get anywhere near it, clear. Aye. Hunter moved quietly up the corridor towards a half-open automatic door. Beyond was a medium-sized laboratory-like room with a large workbench structure in its center. The room was empty, but there was a closed automatic door along the opposite wall. A rumbling crash shook the corridor. The Marines and engineers all looked around for potential threats. Another rumble filled the hallway. Uh, Sounds like our friends in the 14th are introducing themselves to Atwell's welcoming committee, Hunter said quietly. Let's move. We don't have a lot of time. 